Okay, um, people can log on as it's going on, but I think we're gonna get started here. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you had joined us previously last week for our first um, session in the advocacy series, thank you so much, welcome back. My name is Allison Mallinger. I am the Advocacy and Communications Associate for WRJ. I recently just started. Um, I just graduated from Indiana University with a degree in journalism and political and civic engagement. So I'm very excited to be working on this advocacy series. Um, I will be now turning it over to Julia Weinstein, our Vice President of Advocacy and Marketing and Communications to discuss our, um, to present our speakers for this series, um, for this session rather, um, and continue our, our um, WRJ Women Act series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allie. Um, again, welcome to everybody joining us today. As uh, you may already know, WRJ has a long and proud history of advocacy and engagement on public policy issues. And we take action on the basis of existing resolutions and policy statements adopted by our leadership. Um, our advocacy work is grounded in the values of reform and progressive Judaism, and our current advocacy campaign, WRJ Women Acts, is intended to educate and organize our women to be effective leaders and advocates for the values we share. Please visit our webpage, wrj.org slash women act for more information, for resources including the 2017 advocacy plan and for updates. As Ali mentioned, this webinar is part of our WRJ Women Act campaign, and it is the second one in the series. It's a monthly series. The first was on women's health and the Affordable Care Act. The next webinar in November will discuss DACA recipients and the DREAM Act. And today's webinar will focus on some of the high priority issues that the Supreme Court will be addressing in its next session, which begins today. At the end, we are going to allow time for Q&A, which Ali will um, monitor. And I believe there is a um, Q&A panel in your app that will allow you to uh, list your questions and then Ali can uh, take them up when she is ready. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Up first is Barbara Weinstein, no relation. Uh, Barbara is the Associate Director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism in Washington, D.C., and the Director of the Commission on Social Action of Reform Judaism. She directs legislative policy and helps guide the RAC's social justice work. Her background is in public policy, focusing on women's rights, civil and human rights, and the environment. Following Barbara, I am pleased to introduce Daniel Goldberg, Daniel is the legal director for Alliance for Justice. Alliance for Justice is founded on the belief that all Americans have the right to secure justice in the courts and to have their voices heard when government makes decisions that affect their lives. Daniel is an attorney who previously served as chief of staff of the Department of Justice Office of Legislative Affairs. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Barbara. Thank you. Great, thanks, Julia, and it is lovely to be with you as always. Um, I think if we go back far enough, we probably are related. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so um, everyone can follow along, but first I'm going to, just give me a second here, get the PowerPoint going. There we go, is that looking good? And nod, okay, fantastic. Um, well, I wanted to start off uh, by sharing a uh, quote. It's a few years old now from our former president of the URJ, Rabbi Eric Yaffe. And it speaks to the social justice principles that are at the core of what it means to us to be reformed Jews. And I wanted to share it because as all of you on this call, I'm sure know, our movement speaks on more than 70 different social justice issues from healthcare to the environment, reproductive rights, civil rights, immigration, and of course, gun violence, which I know today is weighing so heavily on our hearts and minds as we think about the horrors that unfolded overnight in Las Vegas. 
But we know that adoption of legislation is not the final step, that our advocacy with members of Congress, uh, with local officials, isn't uh, the end of what happens when we care about an issue, that very often those issues get challenged in the courts. And I'm having trouble advancing my slide. Just give me a moment. There we go. And so what we do when those issues and priorities and values get challenged in the courts is we try and have a say at that point as well. And we do that um, through uh, what we call amicus briefs, what are called amicus briefs, literally friend of the court briefs. They support one of the party's arguments uh, in a case. And it's especially important that we do that because very often our unique faith voice is being challenged. In fact, in many cases that we tend to weigh in on, advocates argue that the faith view is what is at stake, when we of course know that there is uh, often many faith views, that the faith teachings of one tradition are not necessarily the faith teachings of all traditions. And so the American commitment to separation of church and state requires that we protect the ability of all faiths and people of no faith as well to live equally, freely, and openly in our society. On, you, on the screen right now, you see a, a list of past amicus briefs we've joined in just the fat, past few years. This is by far not an exhaustive list, just, uh, just some of the highlights. But what you'll, see that are there, what you'll see is that there are some recurring themes. Uh, very often, the freedom of religion itself is being threatened, and we see that often around cases of reproductive rights and LGBT equality. So, for example, you see U.S. v. Windsor toward the bottom of the list. That was, of course, the case that ended the Defense of Marriage Act, which said that states didn't have to recognize a same-sex marriage uh, that was performed in another state. Opponents uh, of uh, Edith Windsor, who just passed away a few weeks ago, uh, and who also and and the folks who advocated for the Defense of Marriage Act, said that the biblical notion of marriage was between a man and a woman, and then therefore our civil laws should be that as well. They also made the claim that if the Defense of Marriage Act was overturned, clergy might be forced to to sanctify a marriage between a couple who uh, violated their own faith traditions teachings. So for example, a Catholic priest would be forced to sanctify a same-sex marriage. We of course believed otherwise, that we believe that there is a place for the sanctification of uh, same-sex marriages and that the law, a civil law, should be applied equally to uh, heterosexual and, and uh, same-sex couples. The law shouldn't favor one faith tradition's teachings over another. And that was an important voice for us to bring to the table as people of faith, because the argument from other faith groups was in fact so strong. And that happily is the view that ultimately carried the day at the Supreme Court and the Defense of Marriage Act was in fact overturned. But that's why our attention to the courts is so important. We've also joined briefs to support the Affordable Care Act, uh, to oppose the President's immigration ban, to support the Voting Rights Act, to oppose school mandated prayer, to protect the Clean Air Act, and so much more. So how do we come to this decision? How do we actually do this? Well, there's a committee of representatives made up of uh, individuals uh, from the CCAR, the URJ, and WRJ, Julia is, is one of the WRJ representatives, all of whom have legal backgrounds, and their job is to assess the briefs that we're considering joining to the court. Usually those briefs come to us from longtime partner organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, the National Women's Law Center, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, uh, American Jewish Committee, and a few others as well. And we consider each of the briefs in terms of the case itself. Does it address an issue on which we have a clear view? There is clear uh, policy, whether CCAR, URJ, or WRJ. Does it reflect our views and our values? And we also consider, of course, whether the brief is well-crafted and whether we have a unique voice to add. 
Or is it an issue on which a broad group of faith voices sharing a common view by itself makes an important statement? Each of the entities, URJ, WRJ, CCAR, decides individually whether or not to join the brief. In most cases, all three, all three bodies join, but sometimes one or two will join, and for various reasons, one will decide to sit out a case. Um, most of the briefs we join are at the federal level and, and very often at the Supreme Court level. And already we know that there are cases coming in the Supreme Court term that are of importance to us. Daniel's going to go into much more detail and I'm sure talk about the politics on the court now that it's back with a full complement of nine justices that it was missing last year until Justice Gorsuch was sworn in. But we already know that uh, there are a few cases that are, whoops, going the wrong way here, that are going to um, be of particular importance to us. There was, of course, supposed to be a Supreme Court hearing on the immigration ban that got canceled last week when the president issued a new order around, uh, around immigration. But if that comes up, I expect we will uh, take a position on it. Um, uh, Harkening back to what I said a few minutes ago around uh, LGBTQ equality issues, there's the Masterpiece Cake shop versus the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, which involves uh, a same-sex couple that was refused service by a baker who said that baking a cake would uh, violate or infringe on his religious beliefs. So again, speaking to that unique zone we play as a faith voice that believes uh, the law should apply equally to uh, people of all faiths and no faith. Um, issues of voting rights in the Husted v. A. Philip Randolph Institute. Um, and voting rights are uh, of a special concern to us because, of course, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which for decades protected the right to vote and um, sought to combat discrimination in areas where we know historically, especially racial discrimination in access to the polls was prevalent, was so strongly undermined in the Shelby v. Holder case in 2013. And the Voting Rights Act itself was drafted in the building that is home to the Religious Action Center um, all those decades ago. So we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Um, and finally, um, a, one other case that uh, I know Daniel's going to talk about is Janus versus American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, which relates to the right to organize and the future strength of the labor movement. And of course, there are such deep and long-standing ties between the Jewish community and the labor movement, so another case that we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, uh, so with that, I'm actually going to pause, turn it over to Daniel, who will talk in greater depth about those and other cases too, I'm sure, and I look forward to Q&A at the end. Thanks. I am also going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is uh, Dan um, at Alliance for Justice and really honored to, to be on this call um, with all of you with such a fantastic um, organization that, that brings such a meaningful voice, uh, not only to Congress, but as detailed to our courts. So thank you very, very much. I'm just going to highlight a couple of cases that, uh, that the court is going to hear this term. Um, it's safe to say, however, it is being set up to be a landmark uh, term by the Supreme Court. To be honest, last term was kind of quiet. Um, the, the court, once Justice Scalia passed away and the Senate refused to confirm uh, Merrick Garland, the court was 4-4. And I think all justices and the court went out of their way not to take the most controversial cases, to have very narrow opinions um, that they could reach consensus on, knowing that they only had eight justices. With Neil Gorsuch back on the court, they've taken some incredibly controversial um, issues, not only these that we'll talk about today, but quite a number of um, potentially landmark cases, for example, in the criminal area, uh, dealing with the Fourth Amendment, um, and countless other cases um, that they, they'll really be settle, setting the law and what our Constitution means, and whether we have a healthy democracy um, for the next generation or two. So um, this is such a timely um, uh, call, and really what the court does over the, the next uh, nine months or so is going to have a, such a lasting impact. Unfortunately, um, I, I'm, I'm not 
too much of an optimist uh, with Neil Gorsuch joining the court and his record on the 10th Circuit and joining the other uh, very, very conservative justices. Um, unfortunately, they're setting up to, to cause some great damage uh, to our constitution and our laws. Um, just a handful of cases just want to highlight to give you a, just a taste of what the Supreme Court's dealing with. One is um, actually being heard today, a case by the name of Epic Systems Corporation for Lewis. Um, this is a case that really will go to um, whether workers um, will have the ability to um, stand up and enforce their rights effectively uh, against large corporations. Um, the, the facts concern um, individuals who did not receive the overtime pay that they thought they were deserved under federal law. And they did what, um, uh, what many people do, is they joined together with other like-minded employees and sued their corporation and said, you are systematically not paying your employees what we're entitled to under law. Um, instead of hearing that case, the, um, the corporations argued that under the, the employment contract, these individuals had signed um, mandatory arbitration agreements um, requiring the, their case to be arbitrated. Uh, not only that, but the corporation argued in these um, arbitration agreements, uh, they were prohibited from banding together and bringing uh, class action lawsuits. So the corporation argued that when the corporations argued that when they were paying uh, their employees less than these employees were entitled to under law, these employees were are prohibited from going to court from enforcing federal labor um, law um, and instead individually one at a time have to challenge each individual payment in arbitration. Uh, you can see that if these mandatory arbitration provisions are upheld, uh, first of all, they'll just become standard in all employment contracts. Uh, all employee, all employers will uh, basically give all new employees a take it or leave it. That if you want this job, you are going to sign away your rights to um, to challenge any action in federal court. And second, that they're preventing um, employee, they would prevent employees from banding together and bringing class action lawsuits, which would um, mean that each individual employee who, for example, is not being paid minimum wage, not receiving the overtime pay they deserve, um, would have to hire their own attorney, would have to um, challenge um, individually each action. You could see that this would be a green light to employers to violate critical federal laws um, and undermine critical pay, uh, payment laws for employees. So this is a huge case for the right of employees, for the right of workers, to really economic justice in our country. Um, the second case I want to highlight is um, the case that Barbara alluded to, the Masterpiece Cake Shop um, case. Uh, this is a case where, um, as noted, uh, a married couple uh, went into a cake shop that was open to all um, persons. There were, uh, it was a business that, that, um, that served all people who walked in the door um, and asked for a wedding cake. And this individual, um, based on his um, purported religious beliefs, said that I am not making a cake for you. Um, and given anti-discrimination laws in Colorado, uh, which recognize that you can't discriminate, if you're a public business, you can't discriminate on the basis of race, on the basis of sex, on the basis of national origin or disability or sexual orientation. Um, this individual is brought to court uh, through the Colorado system and was deemed that he uh, discriminated, contrary to state law. He's challenging that determination in federal court, going all the way up to the Supreme Court, arguing that, um, in effect, his, um, his expressive rights, his rights to, um, to, to free speech, um, and in this case, his right to um, what he considers to the art of making a case, uh, trumps Colorado's anti-discrimination laws. Not only is this a huge case for LGBTQ rights, uh, 
because if it comes out um, for the cake shop owner, then um, quite frankly, any public business, whether a cake shop, a hotel, um, a, a restaurant, um, in many ways could be given a, a green light to discriminate. Um, but it's also a, a question on whether an all anti-discrimination law. Again, the civil rights laws dealing with race, national origin, um, sex, um, all are premised on, um, on public accommodations um, that if you open up your door to the public, you cannot turn away an individual based on your personal uh, biases and bigotry. Um, and if the Supreme Court rules for the cake shop owner, th there'll be a serious question in future cases regarding um, whether more and more individuals can basically exempt themselves from anti-discrimination laws. Um, then uh, another case, as uh, was alluded to, and again, one that will really deal with economic justice in our country is the Janus versus AFSCME case. Um, and the case that here concerns whether public employees must pay dues uh, to a union even if they disagree with the union. Um, back in the 1970s, the Supreme Court actually unanimously had decided a, a case called Abood, um, where um, the, the court said opponents of unions don't have to pay the purely political part of union dues, but they do have to pay the fair share portion, which is designed to prevent free riders from getting the benefits of union contracts without paying for them. You can see that if the case comes out the other way, there'll be no incentive for any individual to pay union dues. Um, and really, it, it will be the end of public sector unions as we know it. Um, to be frank, not a lot of optimism on this case. There, in a case called Friedrichs um, last term, the, the Supreme Court split 4-4 um, four, four. Um, in ruling for those who want to um, in public sector unions as we know it. Um, the four conservative justices, Justices Roberts, Kennedy, uh, Alito, and Thomas would have um, overturned the Boo decision and really crushed uh, union, labor, public sector labor unions. Um, with Neil Gorsuch joining the court now, it's highly likely they have a fifth vote. Um, this will mean considerably weakening of bargaining power for um, labor unions um, in our country. Um, and then finally, you just wanted to highlight um, two um, election cases, both of which will quite frankly decide whether we have a healthy elections in our country. One is Gil v. Whitford, a case which is being argued actually tomorrow out of Wisconsin. It deals with political gerrymandering, uh, whereby, quite frankly, the court will decide whether federal courts will review um, under the Constitution some of the most egregious gerrymandering that's gone on um, in our country or whether um, legislators will have a green light to um, basically gerrymander to their heart's content. Um, and I think you've seen over the last decade as um, uh, computer technology and data has become more sophisticated, an incredible ability of, of legislators to manipulate political maps so that the legislators themselves are choosing their voters as opposed to the reverse, the voters choosing their legislators. The case out of Wisconsin has egregious facts regarding um, how the Republican legislature in the state, despite winning um, a, either a slight majority or a slight minority of the vote, is able to maintain a supermajority control of the state legislature. Um, and the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals had act, or I'm sorry, a three judge panel in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals had actually found that um, this case was so egregiously gerrymandered that it was unconstitutional. In the past, the Supreme Court has shied away from ruling um, partisan gerrymandering unconstitutional as opposed to racial gerrymandering. And um, there, there is a question whether these facts are so egregious that the court, in particular Justice Kennedy, um, he has he found a partisan gerrymandering that just goes too far. Um, and then the last case I just want to flag is the Husted case. 
Um, this is a case out of Ohio where the Ohio Secretary, Republican Ohio Secretary of State, um, for lack of a better term, purged voters off the, the voter roll. Um, they went through and um, unregistered anybody from who had failed to um, vote in past elections. Um, quite frankly, this is imminently, um, uh, it, it runs afoul of both the Voting Rights Act and the National um, Voter Registration Act, um, also known as Motor Voter, passed in the 1990s. Um, and if it's allowed to stand, would be basically um, allow state governments to purge voters from, from their voter rules. The burden would be on the voter then to re-register, first of all, to know that they were kicked off the voter rolls, and B, to re-register, um, which you've seen in states across the country. Um, states are also making it incredibly difficult to register to vote. So this would be a way to um, purge, um, in many cases, minorities um, and, and students, um, individuals who don't have as um, consistent a voting record as um, some, some other voters. Um, and the consequences of it would, would really be um, minimizing uh, the amount of people who can come out to vote in an election, um, thereby undermining um, the health of our democracy. Um, quite frankly, the, the combination of Gill and Houston uh, are really, are we going to have healthy elections going forward? Um, or are um, state governments going to be able to entrench themselves in power? without meaningful check by the voters. Um, so those are just some of the cases. It's, it's going to be a landmark term um, with the five um, Republican, uh, the five judges appointed by Republican presidents um, with conservative records. It, uh, we're not overly confident in an enormous amount of these cases, but um, you never know. Um, that's why we have the arguments, and um, we'll see how it goes. But really want to thank you for, for having me on the call and happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate um, your expertise. Um, and thank you, Barbara, again, for showing it from um, the Reformed Jewish perspective. Um, we're going to start the Q&A portion right now. Um, we already have one question. Um, this can be answered by either Barbara or Daniel. Um, and the question is about, particularly about the Kate case. Can the court rule in a way that protects an individual's free speech and freedom of religion without opening the door to any public accommodation being able to discriminate? Um, and the follow up is there a difference between public accommodation and the proprietary work of an artist as an individual, such as a baker in this case? I'm going to let Daniel take that one. <laughs> uh, terrific questions, and I think those are precisely the questions of the court, um, in particular Justice Kennedy, who will um, very likely be the swing justice here, are, are going to have to struggle with. Um, I personally don't know how they could uh, draw a, write a narrow opinion where they would be able to uphold this one individual's right to um, uh, to deny service um, without opening up a Pandora's box of future litigation um, where each individual business owner, whether a hotel owner or a restaurant owner, um, um, also seeks accommodation. Um, at the, I, I, to be clear, one distinction the, the cake owner is trying to argue here is you don't have to open up all of accommodation laws because um, I am, um, I'm not a, a business owner. I'm basically an artist that my cake is uh, what I use the icing for on the cake is is my art, um, and thus you can um, you can rule for me on freedom of speech, expressive grounds, without getting into freedom of religion and larger issues. Um, I think that's a hard distinction for the court line for the court to make. What is art? What is not art? Um, and quite frankly, it, 
is counter to countless to longstanding practice whereby once a business opens up a door um, to be a public accommodation, they're a public accommodation without looking at the what the business actually does. But the question you asked is precisely what the, the um, cake shop owner here is trying to argue, that I'm an artist, I'm not a traditional business, draw a line for me that doesn't you don't have to go broader. Um, I think it's a hard line to draw, but I wouldn't be surprised if Justice Kennedy trying to cut the baby tries to walk that line. Thank you so much. Um, so to follow up um, on all the cases, what what is a way to, what is a call to action? What can someone do um, on the local level? I know Barbara spoke earlier of how WRJ signs on to different amicus briefs throughout the court session, but what can someone who's listening on this call do now? So one of the things that we are uniquely positioned to, or relatively uniquely positioned to do is speak out on the people who actually sit on the courts. The process by which someone becomes a either Supreme Court justice or federal court justice requires Senate confirmation. So number one, making sure that you vote uh, and that when you vote, you are taking into consideration the candidate's views on the role of the courts, the kind of questions they're likely to ask a judicial nominee, and then reaching out to your senators when a federal court nominee is being considered by the Senate and letting them know what you think about that individual. Uh, for certainly Supreme Court justices, the RAC always provides a opportunity for uh, Reform Jews and others to submit questions that they would like to have the nominees asked, and then we share those questions with the Senate Judiciary Committee um, and try and get at the nominees' views on everything from reproductive rights to the separation of church and state on down the line. Um, oftentimes, we'll take a position on a judicial nominee, something that uh, I don't think any other denomination <clears throat> in Jewish life does. Um, and it allows us to weigh in, uh, letting senators know how we, why we feel a particular nominee is or is not qualified to sit on the Supreme Court. And we don't just uh, limit that to the Supreme Court because we know that the Supreme Court itself hears a fraction of the cases uh, that it uh, gets petitioned to hear every year. And so many cases will end at a lower federal court level. So the the people that make up those lower federal courts uh, are also incredibly important in shaping uh, decisions that affect all of us. So that's uh, just speaking out on nominees themselves is one key way that we can shape the outcome of cases that get to the court level. Thank you so much. And a follow up for can that. I add, can I add, actually, can I add one more thing um, on Absolutely. the things that are, yeah. Um, many of these cases are constitutional and the court will have the last, for the most part, will have the last say. Um, but also many are statutory, which means that Congress, uh, that if the court uh, rules in a way that folks disagree with, Congress can, um, uh, can change the statute. So, for example, the Lilly Ledbetter Act. The Supreme Court, if you recall, had ruled against Lilly Ledbetter, making it more difficult for women who had been denied equal pay to bring their cases in court. Congress in 2009 passed a statute um, reversing the Supreme Court's decision and fixing the, um, uh, the, fixing the law in that area. So insofar as the court comes down with statutory cases that, are, um, that you think are wrong, um, folks um, can work with Congress on um, changing that law. So they, the Supreme Court on statutes does not have the final say. Thank you. Um, to follow up just on one thing that Barbara has said, um, that you said that we are the only um, denomination within Judaism to take these stances. Why do you think that's so? Um, it's a good question. You know, sometimes it comes down to uh, a, a denomination doesn't want to be in the position of having to uh, speak out on a member of the own, their own 
denomination who's been nominated to a position. Um, I, I really, beyond that, can't speak to why other uh, entities choose or not choose to do what they do or don't do. Um, we decided about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, 12 years ago now, to adopt a, a policy statement as uh, the URJ, and I, um, it has been adopted, I believe, by WRJ as well and CCAR, um, that allows us to do this and, and roots it in even biblical teachings about the importance of uh, the, actually one of the earliest lessons comes from Moses and his father-in-law Jethro when Moses was feeling overwhelmed and overburdened by the task of judging disputes between uh, the Israelites his father-in-law Jethro Yitro said to him choose wise capable God-fearing leaders to help you in this task um, you know we today know the importance of judges who are able to look at cases uh, on the merits without um, uh, being uh, uh, letting their their ideology overwhelm the constitutional and other principles at stake. Um, so for us, this is something that is deeply rooted in our texts and tradition, and inspires the way we act in you know our modern day twenty seventeen world. Thank you so much. Um, we have one other question right now, um, and. It's kind of looking at the court as a whole. Are there any indications that the conservative justices with the addition of Gorsuch will try to promote a certain political agenda or will they strive to be more non-political? Dan, do you want to take a crack at that? <laughs> I know it's a little uh, difficult. Uh, <laughs> that's a weighty question. Um, I think, uh, look, I can speak from Alliance for Justice. We were uh, very strongly opposed to uh, Justice Gorsuch's uh, confirmation. Um, and the reason was um, uh, when he was a judge on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, um, we felt that he consistently ruled um, in ideological ways and that ignored um, critical legal protections passed by Congress and critical rights in the Constitution. Um, and I think um, there's, there's questions whether, for example, on the travel ban uh, case, will Neil Gorsuch be a, a truly independent jurist or will, um, or will he side with the administration that, um, and the president that nominated him? It's deeply troubling that just last week you had uh, Neil Gorsuch, um, he went to Kentucky and as the AP, AP said, did a um, victory lap with Mitch McConnell going around the state of Kentucky speaking to, to groups there um, with Mitch McConnell who was instrumental in getting him on the court. Just last week, Neil Gorsuch appeared at the Trump Hotel, um, which um, is the subject of litigation and which um, who, who um, um, the president gains money um, off of um, when people use the hotel. So um, I think just with, with respect to Neil Gorsuch, I don't, um, we, we do have great concerns on whether he will be an independent jurist or whether he, he will favor those who, who nominated him. Um, so um, we'll continue to watch him and, and, and see over the next uh, many years on whether he will be independent. But what we've seen thus far is deeply disturbing. Um, and then looking at from the opposite perspective, has there been any backlash um, to those per, um, to those progressive or more liberal judges on the court for doing the same thing, being partisan and pol rather political in their ways? I actually can't think of another in instance where one of the Democratic nominees went to the home state of the political leader who um, who got them confirmed, or a, a Democratic nominee who has gone to um, a, a, a business that enriches the the president of the um, who nominated them. Um, I, I really can't think of, of a comparable um, comparable example. Okay, thank you.
Um, we have one other question right now. Um, what, when you come from a state where all a con all the Congress people ally with the RAC on just about everything, what more can the WRJ membership do? I can partly answer this question. Um, one great thing about WRJ is that we are an international organization. Um, we have women in almost every state within the United States, um, and educating your fellow sisters on these cases and on these issues is a way to help educate um, the rest of the country. Um, spreading this information, holding these kinds of webinars and educational um, info sessions of, of these important cases um, is going to help spread this message. I think that's a really good point, Allie. And I would also add that um, before I came to the RAC, I, I spent five years working on Capitol Hill. And believe me when I tell you that most members of Congress hear infinitely more from people who dislike what they're doing than people who are calling or emailing to say thank you. And so when your members of Congress do something that you um, appreciate and think is worthy of recognition, reach out to them, say thank you, and encourage them to talk to their colleagues as well. Many of our members of Congress sit on um, uh, positions of leadership where they have the ability to, to reach out to their colleagues, whether the other senator in their state or one of the colleagues from an, one of the other 50 states. Um, and that is important as well. So thanking them and encouraging them to use their platform is really vital. Ali, I'm not sure if you're talking, but you are muted if so. Thank you so much. I pressed it twice by mistake. Um, thank you so much for that um, explanation. Um, if there are no other questions, I think we're going to start to wrap up. Um, thank you so much to Barbara and Daniel for joining us today. Um, this was our second segment within the advocacy series. Our next segment will be focusing on, oh, we have one other question, I'm so sorry. Um, are there guidelines that limit the political activity of justices? I think that's more um, geared towards Daniel's expertise, possibly. The, uh, there is a judicial code of ethics um, that um, yeah, applies to all judges. The Supreme Court has um, generally exempted themselves from the the letter of the the judicial code, although they they are guided by by the spirit. Um, um, every justice has in their confirmation pledges pledges themselves to be uh, nonpartisan um, and make decisions based solely on facts and law. Um, as Neil Gorsuch did um, at his confirmation hearing. But um, for most judges, they are bound by a judicial code of ethics. That, that does include the, um, a prohibition on partisan activities. Um, and that's everything from putting a yard sign in their lawn to participating in a, a fundraiser. Um, both justices and lower court judges um, try not to be partisan. Thank you. Um, I do not believe there are any more questions now, but if anyone else has any other questions, um, you'll be receiving an email later today with everyone's contact information to follow up and a recording of this webinar that will be available in this email and on um, the WRJ Yammer group. Um, so thank you so much again to Barbara and Daniel for adding to our conversation today. As you all know now, the session has started um, and there are a lot of different cases that we should be on the lookout for. Um, please join us again next month in our November webinar. We'll be talking about immigration reform, specific, um, specifically focusing on DACA recipients and the DREAM Act. Um, if there are no other questions, thank you so much and have a great day.